You know, I'm gonna do a video here that I'm not so sure I should actually do. And that is giving my opinion on the five worst tractors on the market right now. It doesn't mean they're currently produced, but they are gonna be relatively fresh, you know, in the last 15-ish years or so. Something that's gonna be readily available in the used market, perhaps in the new market as well. This isn't gonna be one brand, it's not gonna be one manufacturer. We'll go across a couple of the major manufacturers there. I'll give you my opinions, we'll give you the reasons why. And in fact, it doesn't actually mean you're supposed to avoid these models entirely. Well, a couple of them, maybe so. But for a couple of the others, it's going to be relative. I'll give you a frame of reference. I'll back up my opinion. But this kind of stems from a repeated question that I'm asked, you know. And, you know, when I hesitate to give this kind of an opinion at the same time, I really don't like it when somebody says everything's okay or I like all of this or, you know, everything's good, right? We all have things that we like that we don't like. And so I'm going to give you my honest opinion. It's kind of off the cuff. You know, I made this list after getting the question over and over. The idea had been on my mind for a while, but um, I don't mean to uh, discount anybody else's opinion. We all have our own and I'm sure you guys will give me yours and I'll get all sorts of flack for this. I'm used to that. But the point being, I want to give you at least what kind of came to mind you know it's a short list of five uh, five models or series it's kind of a combination of all that again it doesn't mean that you have a bad tractor in particular but it's something to be aware of and perhaps some reasons why maybe these are uh, perhaps less popular believe it or not a couple that are on this list are going to be some of the most popular that i sell right now too i know kind of strange huh and for those of you thinking that perhaps this model right here behind me is going to make that list you would be wrong this is actually one of my favorite models I absolutely love it. It's a, a B series Kubota, a B2650 is the model. Uh, two series, it's got a factory cab on there, air conditioning and heat. You know, obviously you can see the back coat. It's got a skid steer quick attach bucket on there too, plus some other goodies on there as well. This is currently for sale. If you're watching in the future, it's probably not going to be at that point. But right now, when I'm putting this video out, it is. So you can get tractors like this or other ones similar to it, bigger, smaller, all that kind of thing. Go to goodworkstractors.com. And if you like what you see, if you enjoy watching, consider hitting that subscribe button right underneath the video. Hit subscribe. Make sure you read through the description as well. I put all sorts of links to good stuff for tractor owners. Okay, so let's talk about the Kubota B3350. That is a model that I think you should absolutely avoid. I'm sorry for those of you that have it. I've had actually a lot of phone calls over the years from folks that either want to trade in a B3350 or ask me questions about what's going on with it and how they can fix it. You know what? I feel bad. I feel your pain for all of you guys that have those B3350 issues. You know, if you haven't done so yet, if you're considering it, just Google B3350 problems or issues or B3350 probably just by itself and you'll get all sorts of thread and forums that come up with just story after story about the issues that they have with the regeneration problems on the on that model specifically, which believe it or not, is this guy's big brother right here. So this is the B2650. It does not have um, any tier four compliance on it. it it's underneath the um, the horsepower requirement for that. However, it's big brother, and I don't want to paint this as a picture of regen and tier four compliance in general because all the other models that are out there don't have these kinds of issues. It's the B3350. So did Kubota step up and take care of all of those problems that were related to the regeneration issues with the B3350? They did not, no. And in fact, I've had phone calls. I've had folks that have said they are forming class action lawsuits. They're gonna sue Kubota. They've threatened dealers. They've sued dealers. I've had all sorts of this correspondence. I've got a couple of them that are want me to just share their information all over the place. I still don't feel comfortable doing that. But the point being, stay away from that model. Now, I have been told from quite a few Kubota dealers all around the country, that's where I get my equipment, other dealers around the country, okay, that these problems aren't gonna be as prevalent in warmer climates. So it's really the northern climates like Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Minnesota, all that kind of thing, anywhere up north where it's, where it's relatively cold, you're gonna have a lot more problems, supposedly. I wouldn't know I don't live in the south. However, I've been told, you know, if you're gonna sell them or if you're gonna get rid of them, do it somewhere in the south. So maybe some of you that are, that are living down south and, and have a B3350, you have some experience, maybe it's been okay or problem free, I don't know. But, you know, the guy that, uh, just almost wouldn't leave me alone. He wanted to just make sure that I had all the information as I possibly could. I lived in Missouri, which is a relatively you know, moderate climate as far as the US goes. The point being is that you have to go through the regeneration process entirely for that model of tractor to work. And the fact that you can't do it, that it'll just sit there, it'll fail regeneration over and over and over. And they'll be sitting at the, at the dealer and the service department there repeatedly just trying to correct those issues. That's, that's just an utter disgrace. And the fact that they wouldn't have taken care of that is 
I don't even have any words for it. But finally, Kubota did replace that model with the LX3310, okay? So it's, what is it, the LX2610 and 3310? So um, that B series, you know, as far as on paper is gone and it's been replaced. So hopefully the replacement model, the LX3310, does not experience those same problems. Okay, so next one up on the list is gonna be the John Deere 2320. And to a lesser extent, but still applicable, the John Deere 2305, okay? and so. These are going to be a bit older, you know, the mid 2000s ish, maybe to the late, you know, around 2010, 11, something like that. The problem is the drive shaft. Okay, you come off the engine, you're going back to the transaxle there, the hydrostatic transaxle. Right in that point, there's a U-joint. Okay, just in the front of that transaxle there. And the problem is, is that the manual for the first however many years didn't even make mention to the fact that you were supposed to grease this U-joint, this area right here. Nothing even mentioned about it, so how would you really know how to grease it? Plus, it's in a really hard to reach location on top of it, so that didn't help either. So I have some personal experience with this because just right over here, the corner of my lawn here, I don't know, three or four years ago, I had actually had one sold, okay? This was back when, maybe it was longer than that, back when I was actually operating out of this house right here, and things were kind of a hobby. I still had a day job, all that kind of thing. I had this tractor sold. I was shuffling equipment around. The thing just stopped working. The thing just stopped right in my yard. I just heard a loud clanking, banging noise, and then nothing would move. You know, the engine was still going. I had to turn it off. I look underneath. There's just hydraulic fluid just gushing out all over the grass, all over the lawn. Turns out it was a catastrophic failure, okay? And it ended up being the most expensive repair bill I would have ever entertained. Although I sold it as is, I figured, you know what, I can take a lower, a smaller loss selling it to somebody who is handy and has a time because the parts themselves are about a thousand ish, maybe 1200 bucks, something like that. It was a labor. I think there was over 40 hours of labor, if I remember right. And so it was going to be well over a $4,000 repair bill. Now, most of the failures in that situation are going to happen outside of the rear transaxle. Mine actually happened inside of the rear transaxle because that's my kind of luck. On top of that is the fact that that drive shaft that's still spinning coming off of the engine is just sitting there flopping around and whacking everything. Fortunately, it's underneath that floorboard, so you, the operator, has the protection. But that's still really a pretty scary situation if you think about it. And so, yeah, again, I had that tractor sold. I was simply moving things around. The customer hadn't picked it up yet. We reversed that transaction there, and I ended up selling that for a loss. And a little bit more background even, that tractor had 360, 370 hours on it, under 400 hours for sure. So it didn't have a lot of time on it and it happened to fail within two hours or so of, of actual drive time that I had it. It just, that was the point in time where it happened to fail. What a crazy coincidence. Okay, so let's talk about a series of tractors that I actually sell quite a few of. That's gonna be the Kubota BX series. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm gonna get all sorts of constructive criticism over this one. But if we're being honest, you know, I had to make this list, okay? And so if you're putting things into perspective, if you're comparing subcompact tractors, you know, I'll get folks say that they need to compare or that I need to compare a 1025 to a B2601. I'm pretty sure that's hogwash. But um, if you're comparing an actual subcompact to a subcompact, the 1025 versus the B2680 or the B, uh, the BX23S, you know, it's, it's direct comparisons. There really is not much of a competition there. You know, the loader capacity on the BX series is horrible compared to the 1025R. Um, you don't have a standard drive over mower deck. I have tried out their drive over auto connect mower deck, which, or easy over whatever it might be called, their version of it, and I think that's fine. However, it is totally unrefined. It's a really kind of a clanky system. And the same thing can be said for their new Quick Park uh, loader. Now it is, you can be done from the seat, you know, it's making improvements, there's a lot of strides there, but there's so many little um, rods and brackets and nuts and, and fittings that are connecting this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece. It's just a really rickety system. I don't think it's um, a very robust system. I think you're going to have problems over the long term. However, it is a step in the right direction. You know, but coupled on top of that, the fact that the price is so close to a 1025R, your geographic region is going to kind of determine those prices. Sometimes a 1025 is going to be more, sometimes it's going to be less than a Kubota BX. Um, and now definitely there are Kubota series that are way better than John Deere. And this is just simply my opinion. I'm giving it to you. I still sell this tractor because some folks just, you can bleed green, you can bleed orange, you can bleed red, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. So I still think that they're heads and tails above a lot of the competition because of their reliability. You still have some pretty darn good features on there. Very good resale value and a great network for uh, parts and service for your dealers. However, this is one of the most common questions that I'm asked is I'm in the market for a 1025R or a BX, which one would you choose? And if we're talking about the subcompact market, 
I really don't think it's a competition. It's a 1025R for me all the way. There you go, folks. So the John Deere 3E series family of tractors, okay? We're talking the 3025E, the 3032E, the 303080. Now we've gone through, I think it's three renditions, you know, updates. There was the original model, then it was updated in 2012 or 13, then it was updated in 2018, okay? So there have been some improvements along the way. I would encourage you to check out the other videos I've done on my channel comparing the 3E versus the 3R or comparing the 2R versus the 3E. You're gonna find that that 3E series tractor is um, it's a it's a thing of its own, <laughs> you know. And when I say that, it's because some some of the capabilities, even some of the specs, you know, the 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 weight of a two R, like a twenty thirty eight R or twenty thirty two R, that base weight of that tractor actually weighs more than a three E tractor. And with a three R, a three R weighs so much more than a three E, and the loader capacity is so much greater than a three E that this isn't really a knock if you're looking at a standalone tractor at the 3E family of the tractors. But it's more a knock on that series of tractors when you're comparing it against what's supposed to be a step down in a 2R and what's supposed to be a step up in a 3R. It doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, for the first, I don't know, 10 years of its life, the 3E family of the tractors couldn't even have a backhoe put on it. Why would you design a tractor that couldn't have a backhoe on it? Now they did remedy that when they came out with the redesign in 2018, but also it's got that two range hydro transmission. That's a big deal for me. It's just a very light tractor. You know, if you've ever used one of these tractors without any ballast weight, and I don't recommend you do that, make sure you check out the ballast weight videos that I've done. It's very important. And I get the fact that they're supposed to be a plain Jane, kind of an economy almost, or utility, just basic tractor. And again, as a standalone, I like them. And they're probably the second most popular series of tractor that I sell. And it's direct competition is really the Kubota L series, the standard L, not the grand L. So it gets very confusing. I understand that, but the standard L is going to be several thousand dollars more. Don't let anybody fool you. I sell used tractors for a living and there, there's just no comparison. Okay. It is several thousand dollars more. I don't want to hear it any other way, but you do get a heavier tractor. So, you know, in my mind, weight, you know, if you're dimensionally roughly the same and you're a lot heavier machine, then really that's gotta be more weight, which is a stronger or a heavier material. I just feel like it's just built a little bit more robust. You also get that third range. Okay, you're gonna have that medium range in there. And you're also gonna have a quick park loader so you can take that loader on and off. However, the loader capacity is roughly about the same. So take it with a grain of salt, but the point is, is that I'm trying to round out this list and if I'm looking at the 3E as a standalone, it's okay. If I'm looking at it and trying to sandwich it in between what's on a nominal scale there, you know, 2R, 3E, 3R. So things should be generally sloping up, right? Well, something doesn't really jive with the 3E amongst that list. Okay, so last on my list, and this is not gonna be a John Deere or a Kubota. It's actually gonna be, have you guessed it? Everything else. <laughs> so that's kind of how my business operates, all right? So I've got the John Deere's, I've got the Kubota's. I really like to stick with that. And I like to stick with that for a variety of reasons. So number one is gonna be the fact that it's resale value. You know, I, I just kind of come from a general business perspective and, and a value and a numbers perspective in everything that I do in life, okay? And so when you look at a John Deere or a Kubota, they are gonna hold their value so well over time. And in fact, you're gonna hear multiple stories of folks that bought theirs 15, 20 years ago and sold it for just as much as they paid for it back then. And a lot can go into that, I understand. There's a lot of different factors that go into it, but you're gonna see that after that initial depreciation hit, and that's why I kinda always steer folks away from buying new and uh, buying used instead, because you're gonna avoid that initial 15, 20% hit, whatever it might be. But after you realize that, these things are gonna sit there and hold their value even as you start to accumulate hours. John Deere, Kubota, they have dealers all over the country. And sure, there's gaps. You know, There's gonna be places where you might have to drive an hour and a half or two hours, but for the most part, and a huge swath of the country, you're within a half hour or so of a John Deere or Kubota dealer. And so yeah, you could have a good dealer or a bad dealer and that could definitely sway you towards one manufacturer and that makes sense. But generally on top of that, they're gonna have really good reliability and that's not to say they're problem free. Everybody's gonna have a bad apple here and there. Some models as we've discussed in this video are bad apples as well that you should avoid. So this is not to say that either one of those manufacturers are perfect, but I do feel like they are heads and tails above the rest in reliability. And really on top of that are gonna be features, okay? So you're gonna have, I feel like, a lot more features that are gonna be available on the Kubotas and the John Deere's in general. Couple that with the resale value, the support, you know, with your dealer network there for parts and service. You know what, and there's no change in some of you guys' minds. Whether it's green or orange, one of the two is probably, maybe both are overpriced junk, right? You're just paying for the name. I don't know what to tell you about that. But I'm telling you, you do yourself a disservice if you don't consider 
what your resale value is because all the tractors that I get, all of them that you see on my website are all trade-ins at some point. And I'll tell you, a lot of those are trade-ins when they didn't think they're going to be trade-ins. You know, folks just change circumstances, whether they lose their job, whether they move, uh, whether they decide they want a cab, whether they had just have different needs. They, they bought the wrong size to begin with. And so if you go into a tractor thinking it's going to be the one forever, that might be the wrong way to look at it because a lot of folks are changing tractors after a year, after two years, after three years. So if you don't buy something at a good price point, at a good value, then you're probably going to end up losing a lot of money down the road. So I would encourage you to check out Kubota, to check out John Deere, to check out Good Works Tractors. We can get you a good, clean, low hour tractor. Avoid that initial depreciation hit. Find a machine that might even end up appreciating over time, or at least depreciating very little as you accumulate hours on it. Again, if you enjoyed the video, would you consider hitting that subscribe button below? I really appreciate you stopping by. Make sure you check out Good Works Tractors and read through that description as well. A lot of helpful links down there and fun stuff for tractor owners. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon.